um, good afternoon everybody we have a uh, panel discussion on constipation uh, in the panelist uh, most of you are familiar with dr sobna bhatia and then if i am correct dr um, karmarkar and then professor jankaria then sandhya and then rajesh is that right uh, let me have a feel uh, uh, how all of you have the same functional constipation how, how many of you are using polyethylene glycol to treat functional constipation all of you none yeah many of you good um i'll start with the case and uh, dr karmarkar among the panelists i think you are the person who is uh, handling maximum constipation cases i suppose because uh, in our pediatric practice constipation goes to surgeon because all of us have the feeling that we are we should not miss hasman disease so i will take your help in analyzing the case so maximum question will go to you uh, uh this is a 3 years old girl we have seen came with a complaint of passing hard stool once in 3 to 4 days for the last 6 months and she also had encopresis once or twice per week uh her stools are absolutely hard like a stone large in uh, quantity associated whenever she passes she cries and there are history of uh, face bleeding per rectum it is mainly sticks the stool once in 2 to 3 weeks so uh, sir dr karmakar uh, what are the other relevant uh, history you would like to ask this child who has come with a stool hard stool passing once in 2 to 3 days Um, this duration of the history is from 6 months 6 months yeah so i'll confirm that there was no was sir i said it is a two and half years onwards is last 6 months she is having problem yeah so only okay. for 6 yeah. months 6 months yeah so we'll confirm that the history is definitely only in these last 6 months and not since earlier right right and then of course if uh, need be we can ask about history after birth whether there was delayed passage of meconium but one thing which i definitely like to ask is dietary history yes i think most such cases of acquired functional constipation in our practice in my practice are most of the times dietary and sometimes surgeons don't tend to ask about that at all uh, plus many of such cases we need to know whether they are bottle fed exactly. and bottle uh, persistent bottle feeding is again something i have seen to be a cause of uh, chronic constipation in this age group and i follow a policy of not talking to them further if there is a history of bottle feeding unless they stop the bottle feeding habit now exactly in fact if a, somebody rings me up with these complaints and on the phone i ask them is the child bottle fed and if the answer is yes i say don't pl please don't come and see me till you stop the bottle so these are some of the yeah. things that i will ask plus the others that yes, i yes. think have come yes. up yes you, you talk of this uh, i think it is very important to ask about delayed passage of meconium and uh, very interestingly this phenomena is noticed that uh, retentive posturing or withholding maneuver that uh, parents will tell you that the my child is trying hard to pass stool but he can't so that is basically the other way around this child is trying hard not to pass stool and they make this uh, scissor like movement they kiss cross their leg and try to uh, withhold uh, in pediatric practice sometimes the drugs can cause constipation like anti convulsant etc etc very importantly diet i i i endorse your view that this is the milk these kind of children they are predominantly on milk there is no winning diet at all and you need to know about neuro developmental delay can have constipation um, associated failure to thrive etc etc um uh, This child history is a born to uh, primary gravida mother, full term normal vaginal delivery. She passed meconium on day one, so there is no delayed passes. She was breastfed till five months, and then what you said, sir, predominantly on milk. Every day she was gulping 1.5 liters per day with bottle, no roughage at all. Developmentally normal. There is drug history. She was given lactulose by pediatrician, taken two weeks, improved. Mother stop. Constipation recurred. and this is the history we get often uh, the posture of the child during defecation 
she passes stools in standing position she doesn't want to sit she screams while while passing stool she tends to hide behind the curtain does a criss cross leg movement moves her pelvis to and fro so it is mother interpretation is that my child is trying hard actually she is trying hard not to pass stool so this is a very important history if you get that goes in favor of functional constipation uh, examination finding anthropometry normal no pallor neurologically child is normal spine is normal sir uh, dr karmarkar uh, what will you look for in the abdominal examination including bottom uh, if if it's a case of acquired functional constipation usually in the abdominal examination there will not be huge distension as one would see in cases of congenital uh, constipation so i wouldn't expect the abdomen to be huge and distended however because of the chronic nature of constipation there will be fecalomas which may be felt yes sir but this ab abdomen will not be like the hirschsprung's abdomen a large pot belly kind of and overall the uh, size of the abdomen will look quite normal as compared to the remaining body so th that is and we may see fecal sir, omas sir i want you to emphasize okay. this point yes in in these kind of cases you will find that there is hard stools right up to the verge right up to the anal verge and depending on how many days the child has not passed stools it may be hard fecolits with maybe some degree of uh, uh, a fissure may yeah. be there which may cause some bleeding right. one point of which i want to mention here is very rarely there can be a variety of congenital constipation which can have stools up to the verge and that is what we call as the ultra short segment hirschsprung right. or the internal sphincter achalasia and that is one a uh, congenital problem yeah. which may manifest with hard stools yes, up to just the like functional constipation with difficult hard stools to, up to the yes world yes sir yes sir so um, we agree this uh, abdomen was absolutely soft no distension what dr karmakar has said uh, but there was fecal is palpable in the left iliac fossa and uh, simultaneously as a pediatrician you need to look for any uh, neurological abnormal like buttocks are symmetrical asymmetrical signifies some neurological problem anal opening position whether it is anteriorly located or not reflex the uh, uh, anal reflex you give the stimulus see whether the uh, uh, any neurological problem sphincter tone obviously you do and pr is very important ma'am is since morning telling that in pain also you should do pr so pr examination is a must in it when you examine a child with constipation that will give you maximum information uh, the hard fecal mass in this child and there is no uh, one uh, Uh, point that you withdraw the finger gas of fluid comes out in hirschsprung which was not there in this case um dr sandhya uh, clinical impression it is very simple clear cut isn't it functional constipation yeah right um functional constipation uh, in view of onset early we started after infancy around 2 to 2 and 1/2 years the time when you are supposed to transit from liquid to solid they don't do it properly see this baby passed meconium on day 1 there was associated withholding or retentive posturing history of encopresis and bleeding pair goes in favor of functional rather than congenital megacolon and parietal examination showed full of fecal matter and there was no apparent neurological abnormality inflammatory or metabolic blah blah causes so this this fits with functional constipation um uh, dr karmarkar sir uh, will you do what will you do will you investigate this child or you will start treatment straight away uh, well i won't investigate this child very specifically i mean there may be some general tests and which you may want to do in a chronically constipated child maybe anemic so you may want to know his yep. or her hemoglobin etc but from a surgeon's point of view i would not do any specific tests and which may be a red herring and take you into some different direction yes. we are having uh, all together different ambience now in the morning we have lot of firework between physician and surgeon now surgeon is totally in uh, in uh, <laughs> uh, 
with the physician <laughs> dr sandhya do you agree with uh, dr karmaka he is a senior yeah. pediatric surgeon um, um from the pediatric point of view yeah. because the diet is mainly milk they are likely to be iron deficient yeah. um they may be so you may want to just do a basic blood count um depending some people feel that if it's the first presentation to a uh, to a to a pediatrician then they should have baseline thyroid function done as well okay. um that's a, still a controversial but apart from a, a blood count i personally would just say if the child's growing well i wouldn't even worry about that because the treatment is iron which is going to make them more constipated i'd want to treat the constipation first so no right. no test right um this is the actually uh, algorithm postulated by north american society pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition in their position paper uh, this child is more than one year what uh, sandhya is highlighting about thyroid profile is more important to rule out that in an infant when it is coming with constipation and you are worried about harspang in infant and uh, if it is a more than one year you are uh, less chance of having thyroid so uh, they said that uh, history and physical examination is enough to make a diagnosis of functional constipation um and you decide if there is a fecal impaction like this child having fecal is palpable pr full of feces then you have to do probably disinfection first and then maintenance therapy and then observe okay the reassessment is important if this child is not improving on your uh, regular therapy then you look for uh, co other causes like blood test for thyroid uh, late poisoning celiac disease rule out harspang uh, etc uh, etc et um sandhya the management protocol for functional constipation just a brief outline um disinfection right. followed by yeah um the pit, the the child needs disinfection his rectum is full of hard feces so you could pour in a high dose oral laxatives it's just going to bypass and cause overflow so the way to disinfect there are two thoughts both of which are reasonably effective one is the use of enemas Now in the western world people are more reluctant to use enemas I'm not sure what the state is in India um but with the um the preparation of pegylated glycol now one can use disinfection um there are two ways one is the clean prep preparation which requires admission to hospital nasogastric tube and pouring 3 liters of a glycol type preparation um or the other way is to actually use Muvicol which the parents then give and you would then have to give um some people go slowly work upwards i prefer high doses for 2 days and then reduce by 2 sachets per day so you would start for a 2 year old 6 sachets daily for 2 days then 4 then 3 i find however that for disimpaction if you don't use an enema it just takes much longer because the feclis have to break down but the importance is once the disimpaction has been done the child will need maintenance treatment and to explain to the parents that not to stop the medicine as soon as they think a stool is starting to be normal um in the olden days it was a, a step up you start with a bit of lactulose which is a stool softener and then you use a stool stimulant i think nowadays with the new preparations um we're often bypassing those um because you can use um uh, mucol for maintenance treatment as well um Uh, our index patient we have done uh, what uh, sandhya said that disinfection but what we practice we uh, the smaller kid we admit because it is very difficult to do disinfection at home you give the prescription they will not be able to uh, give that quantity of polyethylene glycol solution this child will vomit so what we do we put a nasogastric tube we give uh, a dose of perinum and then we give this infusion of polyethylene glycol solution 25 ml per kg per hour till the output is absolutely clear okay this is the protocol we follow and after that uh, we are doing a study randomizing polyethylene glycol versus laxit lactulose this child was on polyethylene glycol we have given dietary advice to decrease milk and increase uh, rafes and uh, simultaneously toilet training um sandhya already you touched upon about this disinfection with enemas versus polyethylene glycol um how effective is the home based disinfection because that you practice probably is it in the in the young infant i i also would admit to hospital use an nasogastric tube and clear them out um in the older child 
um, the traumas of putting the NG tube down and having the fluid. Um, so we're finding that using the oral high-dose Muvicol, um, it depends on the parents. If they really understand the, the issue, they will enforce it. Um, we are strict, you know, we'll make sure they don't have it fluids only for the first 24 hours and then only jelly for the second 24 hours and then they're allowed to eat. Um, and I would say that it, one has to do it on an individual basis, um, judging on the family, but the younger ones, we admit. Yep. And uh, we had this impression that uh, though the enema is very effective, in adult practice you give enema and uh, do the bowel cleaning, but in children, especially functional constipation, Dr. Karmakar will uh, agree with me that the main problem is the pain. They have a fear of passing stool because they will, they had it in mind, if I pass stool, then that will hurt me. So that's why they don't want to pass stool. Uh, so the pain is the b basic problem. And you put a, a catheter into the rectum, that will aggravate this problem. So though it is a very effective, faster mode of disinfection, but it is invasive, likely to add fear and discomfort. So uh, we try to avoid. But very interestingly, there is a study published recently from Netherlands. And they have compared this enema versus polyethylene glycol. And they said um, both are equally effective. So you can do it uh, with uh, enemas also. This is the only one odd study. We, we may not agree with it. Uh, Sandhya, uh, uh, after disinfection, you will start on laxative. So which one do you prefer, lactulose or polyethylene glycol as a maintenance therapy? Um, my personal opinion is lactulose is useless. Um, so is there any added advantage of polyethylene glycol over lactulose? It is both are equally effective. Um, I, I disagree with that. Okay. <laughs> um, with, um, with the pegylated glycol, um, I think that the way the pegylated glycol works, it's a more effective medication than just having a stool softener. Yep. Um, and there it's easier to adjust the doses by increasing the sachets and I think the studies have shown that actually it is superior to lactulose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fortunately uh, now in India we have uh, polyethylene glycol sachet with or without electrolyte available so uh, it is not difficult to procure and use it uh, but uh, it is basically scientifically superior to lactulose it doesn't uh, get metabolized in the inside the tummy, so there is no risk of gas formation or pain, and so side effect is less. And uh, this is the meta analysis of five studies, though it is not in true sense meta analysis. There's compare that five studies comparing the lactulose versus polyethylene in children, and four out of five said that statistically significant uh, means more uh, effect with polyethylene glycol than uh, lactulose. Tolerability is equal, side effects are less with polyethylene glycol, especially pain and distension. And uh, advantage of polyethylene glycol, you can use the same uh, drug for disinfection and maintenance therapy. Uh, Karmarkar sir, uh, just can you elaborate about this diet and toilet training? It's a big problem, isn't it? Uh, uh, absolutely. As I said, I mean, I would not see a child if he's bottle fed unless the bottle is stopped for 15 days. I wouldn't entertain a family to discuss the problem with me. So uh, what I mean to say is you can't overemphasize the role of diet. And predominantly most of these patients have dietary problems. They lack roughage, they are milk fed, they, have, they are on constipating diets, biscuits, chocolates and white bread and whatnot. So I think it's an enormous task to get them to be on a good, balanced, healthy diet. I mean, the whole family needs to be trained and spoken to about this. You don't want them sitting in front of the TV and munching whatever comes. That's very difficult because we do it ourselves. So to tell them not to do it is very difficult. But that's one, and toilet training. I mean, it's especially, I think, in urban India with, you know, busy lifestyle, Toilet training is being grossly neglected in children. And especially in big cities, both f parents working. Unlike the old times when you had joint families, large families, there used to be somebody to train you to sit on the potty every day at a fixed time. We find that that's very uh, difficult nowadays. So I think these things have to be impressed. 
Uh, yes, sir. Especially just a one line about toilet training. Uh, you just ask the parents to make the child sit immediately after a major meal, because we try to utilize this gastrocolic reflex. There are two types: early and late. So earlier one is stronger. So all of us have. The